got a pig. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You want to know where we're going, don't you? Starbucks. <laughs> Where's Starbucks? I don't know. Harry Teeters? No, there's a freestanding one. You just got to go turn left on Lightfoot. Do not turn right. There's nothing right. Nope. Just don't do nothing. it. There's nothing right about right. <laughs> there's nothing. It's hey, Rochambeau in the woods. A goose. There are geese. Rochambeau in the woods. Yeah. Oh, I gotta get my socks out of the back. I just threw them back there. Yesterday. Rochambeau, you got your orders now? Go, go man, go. go. Oh, I have that in my head. All right, guys, let's just start. Your gun. We're gonna start gun. from the beginning of Hamilton. Okay, ready? How just does a, a bastard or or a Scotsman dropped in the middle of a forgotten spot in the Caribbean by providence impoverished environment? Who ever probably got it on the scholar? The ten would have been ordered and have to be it. Without a father, got a lot smarter. Mom, you're gonna turn a left here. Harder by me and a self starter by me. Oh, darn it, 14. You've shrewded it. Sarah, that's not gonna, that's the first of many. Devastation reigned. A man saw his future dripping down the drain. Put a pencil to his temple, connected it to his brain. And he wrote his first refrain, a testament to his pain. And when the word got around, they said, this kid is insane, man. Took a collection to send you to the mainland. Because you're in education, the same shopping center as Walmart. And we're going to know your name. What's your name, man? Alexander Hamilton. My name is Alexander Hamilton. You don't need to be in the left lane. There's a million things I haven't done. Maybe tear shirt. Just you. Right there, there's Starbucks. Just you. I told you. He was to his father's name. And I've been dead, written in two years. And it's been Alexander's mother, bad, written half dead. Sitting in their own sick, the sun. Alex got better, but his mother went quick. Moved in with the cousin, the cousin committed suicide. Left him with nothing but ruin pride. Something new inside a voice saying, Alex ain't got a thing for yourself. He started retreating and reading every treatise on the shelf. There would have been nothing left to do for someone less the studio would have been dead or destitute without us until restitution started working. Working for his late mother's landlord, training sugar cane and rum and all the things he can't afford. Let it fall, let it fall. Kicking his hands on, never seen just see him now as he's in the ocean. Heading for a new land. In New York, you can be a new man. In New York, you can be a new man. In New York, you can be a new man. In New York, you can be a new man. In New York, just you wait. America sings for you. Never hey, back go. down, never learn to take your time. Oh, Alexander Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton. America sings for you. America sings for you. We know your name, but they know you wrote the game. The world will never. Ship is in the harbor now. See if you can spot him. Another immigrant coming up from the bottom. His enemies destroyed his rep. America forgot him. We, Me, I fought with him. Me, I died for him. Me, I trusted him. Me, I loved him. And me, I'm a damn foolish shot him. Shot him, shot him. There's a million things I haven't done. But just you wait. What's your name, man? Alexander Hamilton. Bam! Oh, whenever she said on the tour last night, does anyone know who Peyton Randolph is? Yeah, he was one of the founding fathers, and every, like, America basically forgot him. I was like, what? Hamilton. What? Alexander <laughs> Hamilton. Hamilton has a whole musical written about him now. now. He's on money. Okay, fine. Ain't nobody forgot Lynn him. Lin-Manuel Miranda's next hit musical is going to be Peyton Randolph. <laughs> Peyton Randolph. I'm so, I'm so pleased. Do you want me to turn around and go Hamilton's through the drive-thru, ladies? Or, no, no okay. needs to pee. Oh, that's Hamilton's right. The Why don't you get the moral of this story? Good morning. Oh, it is a rainy Saturday, you guys can tell, right? Oh, we are in Williamsburg. We are going to Jamestown in Yorktown today. Um... Hope you guys enjoyed that intro. A little bit of Alexander Hamilton for you from the Broadway show Hamilton, courtesy of my posse. 
Um, a little bit about, you know, what we're going to do today. We're going to go to, um, like I said, Yorktown and um, Jamestown. Um, big history buffs in this car. And you guys might not know that about us. Um, two history majors that sit in the back seat. And uh, so this is kind of like what we like to do. Um, we were planning on going up to D.C. That didn't actually get to happen, which is fine. Um, we'll just make another trip to go up to D.C. It just it didn't get pulled together in a, in a time. And you know, it's kind of a short trip, so we're just going to stay in Williamsburg. Complete the triangle of history today. Um, so, guys, I hope that you enjoy this vlog. Thanks for watching. Discussion point on the back, on the bedroom here, in this photo, in this picture, in this this part of the vlog, whatever it is. So, two questions: the throne with the red velvet seat. It's red velvet. You know the. You don't know no better probably when you were back in those days, but I bet it always stunk. Secondly, the curtains on the bed. Why? Do they actually have a purpose? Do they close the curtains at night to keep the draft down? But I feel like if you had this fancy kind of a bedroom, you would have a fireplace. So, were, does anybody know, were the curtains actually closed at night and reopened every day? What's the function of the curtains on the bed, guys? But, I think I'd probably be alright with this bedroom. Just saying. Think, guys, you think you think I could live here? You think I could do this? So, like, one of the things we've been really kind of talking about is, if you knew no better, could you live this lifestyle? Well, of course, if you knew no better, if you, I mean, but coming from the 21st century, and then being implanted into this lifestyle from the 1600s, it would be really hard if you were transplanted. Now, could you do it if you just grew up that way and that was your lifestyle? Yeah, sure, why not? Who would you want to be? Would you want to be a transplant coming from, you know, Britain into it? Would you want to be an Indian that's already settled here? Um, I guess it's just on how you like to live your life now, I guess, right? If you could choose, you probably wouldn't be able to choose. Um, but it's been fun. It's now, you know, seeing all the different ways of living. It's an awesome, awesome experience here in Jamestown. So I hope you guys have enjoyed a little bit of it. The exhibits and stuff, we can't show very much video in it. Um, they don't want you to take pictures and all that. But um, now that we're outside and all the external exhibits, maybe you guys will get more footage on that. So let's go see what else we can find. Primarily, those three are the main ones that we know they were using. Um, 
And then once you have those uh, ropes that are being made from these plants, uh, they're going to be used on a daily basis all around the village for literally almost everything. Um, so from weaving the mats that you see that cover the Yehagans or houses to um, tying the frameworks of the houses together um, and even doing twining, which is going to produce bags and things like this. So um, pretty much anything that you can think of, that rope is the, going to be used for. Um, it's okay. not. It's going to be used, uh, like I said, for almost literally every aspect of the thing. Yeah. It's kind of a crap day to be out at Jamestown because the weather is garbage. But hey, we're having fun. We adapt to everything. We got my raincoat on, got my umbrellas. The ladies went and bought other umbrellas. You know, I got socks because I forgot socks. I also forgot pajamas. Who forgets pajamas? So I'm sleeping in my clothes. But that's alright. Okay. Let's go see the fort. The fort. The fort. England doesn't even have a standing army in 1610, 1607. They have no standardized weapon. They're not even a superpower yet. But they're, they're right on the cusp of becoming a world power, whereas the Spanish are certainly a superpower. Um, this is the first standardized... So loud. Welcome. Oh my goodness. <laughs> the Max Lock Musket, a uh, weapon developed in the latter part of the 1400s. Uh, for the English, uh, this weapon will prove to be a decisive, cost effective weapon uh, made up of only four moving parts. The Max Lock really replaces the bow and arrow as a long range weapon in Europe. Uh, made up of four moving parts, you have a trigger or sear bar connected to a mechanical arm called a serpent or serpentine. And a serpent, of course, is that mythical creature that breathes fire. Uh, the serpentine introduces fire to the gunpowder, <coughs> like so. The simple four moving parts. And many might even refer to this weapon as the first modern or mechanized firearm. Uh, this is really where it all began. <clears throat> the match, of course, is what gives the weapon its name. And what we have here is a length of hemp rope that's been boiled in a mixture of gunpowder and lye. Now, when lye and gunpowder are mixed, the lye breaks up the nitrates in the gunpowder, allowing that black powder to permeate the hemp rope. So in the end, what we have is a 700-degree wick or fuse that burns very slow, but, of course, very hot. Um, and it was carried betwixt the fingers. This is part of what made this weapon a dangerous one. That's why they didn't last as long as they could have. Um, you, you carry your gunpowder in individual wooden bottles that were suspended from a belt called a bandolier. Each bottle holds upwards to 100 grains of gunpowder. Then you've got another eighth of a pound of gunpowder you're carrying in a flask. An equal number of lead shot would be carried in the shot pouch. But, you know, with, with all that's been said, you know, this is not a safe system by any means. This was the technology that, that would prove to be an effective one 
here at Jamestown in, our, in England, during England's first Indian War. Now, aside from the natives, uh, there's the threat of the Spanish attacking uh, Jamestown. Spain was really the perceived threat. Uh, the Spanish would come dangerously close, but they never attacked James Fort. Uh, by 1609, relations between the English and the native would reach a boiling point. By 1610, war begins with the Powhatan. Now, the Powhatan are part of a chiefdom of 32 tribes, all under the leadership of their, their uh, chief, Powhatan. And Powhatan um, really ruled with an iron fist. Um, he required, he, he provided protection from enemy groups like the Monacans, the Monahoics, in exchange for tribute. And all of his 32 tribes paid him through tribute. Of those 32 tribes, each tribe had a sub-chief called a Weirwants that would answer to Powhatan. The people would answer to each of their tribes' Weirwants. Now, the closest village to the English fort at Jamestown was located about five miles to the west, upriver, uh, where the Chickahominy flows into the James, a series of seven towns or hamlets called Paspahay. Um, when the English arrived, the Paspahans were somewhat friendly. Uh, within about two, two and a half years, relations really begin to boil over between both cultures. So I'm going to go through the steps of loading and firing, um, and I will describe each step as we go through the loading process. What type of weapons are the natives using? Bow and arrow, spears. Bow and arrow, spears would be primitive weapons. The bow and arrow was their main long-range weapon. But bear in mind, each Palatine warrior is not only a protector of his village from enemy groups, but he's also a provider of food. So what does he do on a regular basis? Knife. He hunts. And, and it's, it's hunting that these, these warriors would develop the skills that made them excellent marksmen. Most of these English settlers were from large cities like London, Sheffield, Birmingham. They had very little, if any, experience with weapons. Um, so I'm going to go through the steps of loading and firing. This should only take about 20 seconds in the hands of a trained musketeer. And this is something they, that was done by command. So I'd begin by priming the pan, pouring about a quarter teaspoon of powder into the pan, close the pan, and cast the weapon about, pouring the main charge of powder directly down the muzzle. On top of that powder, we would then seat a ball of lead shot, and using a scouring stick to seat that shot firmly on top of the gun powder. Oops. Returning the scouring stick, placing the match into the serpent or serpentine, present your piece, give, fire. Even when you know it's coming.